morning, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to another telehealth immersion program event. Today's session is focused on telehealth for neurology, and we are honored to host today's event in collaboration with the American Academy of Neurology. Next slide, please. During our 90 minutes together, we will start off with a presentation from Dr. Neil Busis, chair of the AAN Telehealth Subcommittee, who will provide an overview of telehealth use in neurology. We then have three speakers joining us today, Dr. Anne-Marie Morse, Dr. Nassim Zekavadi, and Dr. Benjamin Coomer, who will each give a presentation on telehealth use for sleep medicine, epilepsy care, and stroke care, respectively. Dr. Coomer will also speak to several advancements on the horizon for teleneurology as we start to think about the future. After these four brief presentations, we'll then come together for an interactive panel discussion with the speakers, and we invite you as the audience to ask questions live. And with that, I'd like to introduce Michaela Reed, who will introduce our speakers for today. Michaela is the telehealth and practice program manager at the American Academy of Neurology. She previously served as a development director at Care Clinic, a nonprofit free clinic providing integrated health care for underserved communities in rural Minnesota. Michaela is currently finishing her master's in public health at the University of Minnesota, where she is researching the funding mechanisms of assisted living and their impact on equitable access on long-term long care for elderly Minnesotans. Thank you, Michaela, for making today's session and our collaboration possible. I'll turn the floor over to you. Thanks so much, Bernadette. On behalf of the American Academy of Neurology, I'd like to thank you and your colleagues at the AMA for inviting the AN to serve as a collaborator in the telehealth immersion program. Um, we absolutely appreciate the opportunity to develop valuable telehealth resources for the neurology community. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Neil Busis. Dr. Busis is the Associate Chair of Technology and Innovation and the Director of Telehealth in the, the Department of Neurology at NYU Langone Health and a Clinical Professor of Neurology at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. He developed and directs the teleneurology program at NYU and developed and directed the general teleneurology program at UPMC in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Dr. Busis chairs the American Academy of Neurology Telehealth Subcommittee he is the alternate CPT advisor representing the AAN on the AMA CPT Advisory Committee. He is developing new telehealth and hybrid care models, validating the remote neurological examination, and optimizing teleneurology education for learners at all career stages. Dr. Busa has previously chaired or was a member of other AAN committees and subcommittees and has served on the AAN Board of Directors. He received the 2021 AAN President's Award for his service. Dr. Busis is also a past president of the American Association of Neuromuscular and Electrodiagnostic Medicine. Recently, he was a member of the planning committee for the March 2022 National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine workshop on the use of telehealth for disability evaluations in medicine and allied health. Dr. Busis, thank you so much for being here today and I will turn it over to you. Thanks very much. Could we have the next slide? So thanks again to the AMA and to Michaela for that introduction, which may actually be longer than my presentation. Uh, I'm gonna give you an overview of telehealth use in neurology. Next slide. I've received personal compensation for serving as alternate CPT advisor for the American Academy of Neurology and for A and speaking engagements. Next slide. As you know, telehealth can be defined as when healthcare is provided to participants who are not in the same place at the same time. While most of us think of telehealth as basically video conferencing, two-way live real-time interactive audio video interactions, there are at least four other modalities of telehealth worth mentioning. And you'll hear references to these other modalities throughout this program. They are telephone or audio only interactions, asynchronous data exchange or digital evaluation and management services, interprofessional consultations where providers speak to other providers and not to patients, and various types of remote monitoring. And these are the terms that are used in the CPT manual, by the way. Next slide. In November and December 2021, the AMA performed a telehealth survey of physicians we as collaborators in the telehealth emergent program 
we're able to get a customized report just on neurologists. And this shows you the key takeaways from what neurologists are doing in November and December of 2021. And it's pretty recent, so it should be pretty reflective of what we're doing now. Of the survey, 98% of neurologists use telehealth. Per week, neurologists saw 36% of their patients via telehealth. Telehealth enabled neurologists to provide high quality care for many services. Most use cases were for follow-up care, improving access, and medication management. And 75% or more of telehealth visits were with established patients. Telehealth visits were mostly conducted from clinic or home on the case of the physician or from home in the case of the patient. Most neurologists use live audiovisual technology. Some of the other modalities were used, but most of them used the live two-way real-time interactive audiovisual technology. What's particularly interesting is that six in 10 could access their telehealth platforms via the EHR. That means that four out of 10, 40%, had a separate telehealth system from the EHR that they used for in-person visits, which means there's issues with double data entry, scheduling issues, interoperability, information sharing, all sorts of problems. 66% of respondents agreed or strongly agreed that telehealth use has increased their professional satisfaction. And showing that this wasn't just a COVID bubble, practices plan to offer a variety of telehealth services in the future. And we'll talk about some of those possibilities later in the program. Next slide. This table shows the evidence for teleneurology before COVID. The telemedicine work group of the American Academy of Neurology published this paper in January of 2020, which is just a few months before the pandemic. You can see across the top are some quality metrics. You can see down the side, various subspecialties. Note that telestroke is not included because the evidence base for telestroke is really not in doubt. It's very robust and goes back many years as Dr. Kumar will, will talk about. Note also, something really big is missing. There's no column for outpatient general teleneurology. Isn't that something? Note also that if you look at the columns for improved access to care and cost savings, they're basically almost no studies or very few high quality studies. So there's obviously a big gap at the beginning of the pandemic. And we hope that that will be filled in as more and more cases are done in the last few years. We hope that organized studies will be done to expand the evidence base so that we can improve evidence-based practice and advocate for evidence-based policy. So how should we do that? Next slide. The AMA has come up with a really nice framework for measuring the value of telehealth. And I hope that this will be used to organize future studies in teleneurology and other types of telehealth. There are domains of clinical outcomes, quality and safety, access to care, patient, family, and caregiver experience, clinician experience, financial and operational impact. And then underlying all of these is health equity, because obviously you want all patients who need telehealth to be able to access it. Next slide. When we surveyed our neurologists on how they are currently measuring telehealth, we found the following results. Most neurologists currently measure telehealth value via patient satisfaction and access. So the access is not much of a big lift. We're already doing that. Most papers that talked about telehealth during the pandemic first said, here's how we rolled it out, here's how we had access. But you'll notice that quality, the physician experience, and costs, financial aspects, are still relatively understudied. So lots of opportunities. Next slide. Teleneurology started out really as telestroke in the hospital. And as I'm sure you already know, but it's worth emphasizing, the teleneurology experience in the hospital and at home, which is where outpatient teleneurologists are really very different. The processes are very different. In the hospital, you have a proprietary rig with a very high quality camera, speakerphone, microphone, presumably decent bandwidth. You have an assistant who's trained. Here, uh, the assistant is giving the NIH stroke scale to a patient there, doctors on the screen. When you move to the home, the patient brings their own device. So that means not only do they have their own device, but they supply their own bandwidth, they supply their own technical support, 
they supply their own examination. So the processes are really quite different. So let's look at the teleneurology encounter. Next slide. Just like an in-person encounter, the teleneurology encounter has certain basic elements. There's history, there's examination, and medical decision-making. When you think about it, history is really not all that different in a two-way real-time audio video encounter, which is really what we're gonna talk about here, because you're talking, you're showing and you're talking. And as Sir William Moser said, just listen to your patient. He or she is trying to tell you the diagnosis. Medical decision-making isn't all that different either, because basically you take the data that you have acquired during that encounter and before that encounter, you put it together, you synthesize it with your knowledge and experience and you come up with an assessment of plan. So the big difference is the examination because you are not right there able to touch the patient. Next slide. So we went from zero teleneurology visits on March 18th, 2020 at NYU to 100% virtual on March 19th, 20, uh, 2020 rather, 2020. Uh, so we had to figure out how to do a remote exam. And what we did was we crowdsourced it. We talked to all our colleagues in the department said, how should we do this? Because at that point, there was really nothing written about a general teleneurology exam. There was the NIH stroke scale and a few things like the mini metal that had been validated for remote use, but nothing else. So as an organizing principle, we took the 23 element neurology single specialty examination, which has been used by CPT and CMS since 1997. We laid it out and we said, okay, which of these 23 elements can you do to some degree? And the answer is that we could do about 21 of them. We really can't do the cardiovascular exam because we don't have a remote stethoscope or robot fingers to feel pulses. And we can't do the ophthalmological examination because we don't have a remote ophthalmoscope, but everything else can be done one way or another. Next slide. We then had a study which is in press looking at general neurology and headache patients examined by teleneurology. And we asked our providers, our physicians, what were the most useful elements of the virtual neurological examination that you can do to, to have enough information for medical decision-making? And these are the 14 elements that we decided worked. It's not surprising that five of them are mental status because you know it's mainly verbal. Most of the cranial nerves with the ex exception of, of cranial nerve two and some less important cranial nerves, muscle strength, but not tone, coordination, not so much reflexes, sensation, and gait and station. Next slide. To illustrate the adaptations that we made for the virtual motor examination, I show you this slide. You can think of it as four different elements, inspection, self-assist examination, functional testing, and objects. So inspection, this fellow has a right peripheral distribution of facial palsy. You probably wouldn't do that much different if you were in the room with this patient. You, you'd look at him, you'd say, raise your eyebrow, close your uh, eye, smile, frown, et cetera. Uh, and you can also use inspection for fatigue or weakness in myasthenia. Look up for 60 seconds and see if you develop ptosis or double vision. self assist examination. Here, the physician on the screen is telling the patient how to examine their hand. If there's an assistant there that you can train so much, the better, but not necessary. Functional testing. We do this to some extent in the office. I've found that legs are stronger than my arms in almost every case. So I do a lot of this, but you do more of it virtually. Here, this woman was asked to stand up from a chair without using her hands, and she can't. So she either has some lower extremity weakness or imbalance or uh, something like that. And then if you want to try to quantitate strength remotely, you can use objects. If patients have barbells at home, you can say, well, you can lift this barbell and not that one, or uh, cans of food, or uh, abduct your fingers with this rubber band, etc. So this gives you an idea of the adaptations that we can make. And you can examine most things that you need to examine in most cases by using these kinds of principles. Next slide. Now, in addition to the ophthalmoscopic examination, the cardiovascular examination, there are other limitations of the teleneurology exam that may not be quite apparent, even though I showed you those lists. Vestibular testing, for example, while you can get patients to change positions, you know, lie on your side, the bad ear down is the one that makes you dizzy in BPPV, for example, they may be reluctant to change position because if it makes them symptomatic, they're not going to want to do it. For certain detailed assessments of strength or muscle tone or reflex or sensation, especially when you're getting some inconsistent results, 
in person is better. And then there are also patient factors to consider. If patients have trouble with cognition, vision, hearing, or using the technology, if they don't have someone on site to assist them, it won't be a successful encounter. And then remember that certain rating scales, such as the NIH stroke scale, are designed to be used with an on site assistant. So if you don't have that person there, you can't do the rating scale. Next slide. I think that most of you are going to be familiar with elements in this slide, but I wanted to mention them for completeness sake. So in addition to the physical examination, there are a number of barriers to telehealth encounters being successful. The biggest one for years and years has been insurance coverage and pay payment policy. Although there have been some flexibilities with COVID, there's uncertainty how long they'll last. Different insurers have different policies at different times. You only have to check constantly. There's the issue of technology, literacy, and digital divide, and the AMA survey respondents rated that very high as a limitation of, of telehealth. There's location site of service issues, which have been present for a long time, urban versus rural, home versus office. In the past, rural and office were favored. Obviously, we know that telehealth is useful in other settings. We hope the legislation will allow that flexibility after COVID. There are data and privacy concerns. It's not just computer hackers. There are privacy concerns in the home. If you live in a crowded environment, you literally, as a patient, may not have privacy to give an unfiltered version of your history to your physician. I have had patients leave their home and sit in their car to talk to me because that's the only place they had privacy. There are workflows, just like there's uh, check in and check out at the desk when you come to an office. How do you do that virtually to make sure that they're checked in correctly, they're using the equipment correctly, they have the correct follow up? There's education, education at all levels. That's a big thing that we're doing at NYU. Not only have we educated patients and learners, but we've educated everybody else because almost no one knew how to do this before we had to. And there's, of course, the issue of the telehealth evidence base, which I've talked about and we'll talk about again. Next slide. Basically, if you are not face-to-face -face with a patient, uh, you are non-face-to-face. -face. So all of the things we're talking about are variations of non-face-to-face -face services. And what's really good news is that in CPT 2022, non-face-to-face -face services are better supported than ever before. The biggest change is in addition to the care management services family of codes, and those are principal care management codes. In the past, the chronic care management codes required you to take care of two or more problems. Most specialists want to stay in their lane and take care of their patient's neurologic problem. The ability to do that now with the principal care management codes is a game changer. We're going to talk about that a little bit later in a couple of these talks. And the other thing is that all of the digital medicine services that I've talked about and some that I haven't that we'll be talking about later, such as artificial intelligence, are now organized in a wonderful appendix, Appendix R, that gives you a broad overview of the entire field of digital medicine, and it gives you an idea of where we are and obviously gives you an idea of where we can go. Next slide. Much of outpatient neurological care is chronic care management. And I submit that the future of chronic care management is hybrid care, because there are lots of ways to bridge the gap between in-person visits. We envision hybrid care as consisting of combination of in-person care, the principal care management services, and various types of telehealth services with the exact mix of all of these services customized for the patient's needs, their ability to access and use the technology and the evidence base. And as the editor of Modern Healthcare stated, one of the best things about virtual care is caregivers, family, and medical team all can be on the same screen. It's actually easier to get all of the stakeholders, all the different therapists, the caregivers for the family, the family members, the patient, the provider on a screen than it is to get them in one place. Medicine is a team sport and hybrid care supports team-based care better than in-person care. Next slide. So I hope as you go through this program and the other webinars in this series, series you realize that telehealth is the practice of medicine. It's really not about the technology, but it's about workflows and operations. It's a care delivery model. And just like every other tool, 
You use it when it's appropriate. You don't use it when it's not appropriate. The medicine is exactly the same. The appropriate comparator is not an in-person visit. It's the alternative. The alternative often is getting no care at all. You are doing a physical exam. You may have to adapt it, but you are doing a physical exam. Every time you just look at the patient, you're doing the exam. And in fact, as we mentioned, you might get more information than from an office visit in terms of getting the whole team together. And also you can see the patient in their home and understand challenges to their safety, perhaps to their social support system, et cetera. And you should focus on actionable information and possible triage. So if you see the patient and you realize, look, I really need to see you in person or you need to go to a facility or this is an emergency, you need to go to an emergency room, you can triage. The point is you are starting the care journey earlier than you would have otherwise, even if you can't necessarily complete it. Next slide. So my uh, final slide is to point you to AN resources uh, on telehealth. They can be found at an.com slash telehealth. And I particularly want to stress the American Academy of Neurology telehealth position statement because we're using this as a stimulus to give us a roadmap for developing evidence-based practice and policy in the future. Next slide. So this is the first of four talks and I will uh, turn it over to Michaela who will then turn it over to Dr. Morris and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Buses, for that excellent introduction to teleneurology. Our next speaker is Dr. Anne-Marie Morris. Dr. Anne-Marie Morris is a board certified neurologist with special qualifications in child neurology and is a sleep medicine specialist. She is the Director of Child Neurology and Pediatric Sleep Medicine at Janet Weiss Children's Hospital with Geisinger Health System in Danville, Pennsylvania, and is the Program Director for the Child Neurology Residency Program. She has significant clinical experience and interest in pediatric and adult patients with central disorders of hypersomnolence. In addition, her research interests extend more broadly to include investigating the relationship of sleep with neurologic disease. Some of her current research includes participation in studies evaluating neurodevelopment, cognition, behavior and sleep, novel therapeutics for central disorders as hypersomnolence, and validation of novel sleep assessment tools. In terms of community-based efforts, Dr. Morse has developed a school-based virtual sleep education and surveillance program called Wake Up and Learn. This program was developed to provide education about sleep health and perform school-based sleep screening to improve recognition and mitigation of pediatric sleep disorders. Dr. Morris envisions a world where sleep can be acknowledged as the vital sign of health, wellness, and performance. Thank you, Dr. Morris, for your leadership in this space, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate the opportunity to um, be able to present alongside such such an incredible panel of speakers. And following after Neil is going to be a tough act, but I'm going to try. Um, so today, I want to talk about the virtual sleep medicine practice, and really just building on the foundation that, Neil, that Dr. Priestess has already placed with saying that telemedicine is is not the end all be all when we're talking about virtual sleep medicine. And so we'll start off there, but some of the things that I do want to go over are going to be reviewing peer-to-peer -peer consultation. How is it done? What have we done at Geisinger and how can it be proved to demonstrate value, not only to the patient, but also to providers. Synchronous telemedicine care, individual versus group telemedicine programs that have been implemented, remote patient monitoring, as well as reviewing some of the school-based sleep education and screening models that may further disrupt or challenge our current practices in sleep medicine. So when we're talking about the peer-to-peer -peer model, at Geisinger, we have a program called Ask a Doc. This has been implemented for many years now, and it's something that allows for virtual consultation services that can either be from a primary care provider to a specialist or specialist to specialist. This is in those circumstances where you have a patient in front of you and you're going, I think you might need an endocrine or a, or a cardiology or a neurology practice referral. However, the patient maybe has limitations in terms of being able to get to that referral, or it's just a question of, is it really just a um, an acknowledgement from that specialist to give you some guidance, or do they actually need to be seen? Ask a Doc has been extraordinarily successful with 99.9% .9 of questions being answered. And more than 84% of Geisinger primary cares are using Ask a Doc on a regular basis, really saving that kind of 
kicking it down the road and just referring patients um, and really being able to help and getting an answer more quickly. The turnaround time typically is one to three days. So if I had a patient in front of me today and I put in an ask to a specialist, the specialist typically is going to respond most commonly within 24 hours, but typically do have um, the leeway of being up to three days. And the part that makes this most successful is that no one likes to do work for free. The reality is that everyone wants to experience a value in their day. And so if I were to say to my docs, you're going to have to also see patients and do all this additional work, but we're not going to assign any value to it. Many times I would be met with initial enthusiasm, but generally turns into resentment and feeling as though that they're not being recognized for the work that they're doing. So there is an RVU value assigned to the work performed. And so that allows for us to have some understanding of the volumes that they're doing. So when this has been studied, we looked at um, almost 22,000 physician consultations where there were about 2,000 ask -a -doc consults versus almost 20,000 traditional face-to-face -face consultations. When this was evaluated, what was identified was that number one, ask -a -doc significantly decreased turnaround times um, between primary care and specialty physicians. So about six and a half hours compared to what traditional refers, referrals are. And so I can say as a neurologist, many times, although our goal is a time to be seen within 10 days, many times new patients may be, see, may be waiting for several weeks to several months. So six and a half hours is, is really quite a significant improvement. In addition to that, there was cost savings, about 14% reduction in total cost of care in the first month of the program. And that only continued to grow when it was continued to be followed. followed. And we saw that grow to about 20% cost of care. So healthcare utilization was also positively impacted by this. The reasons why were because the fact that we saw that emergency room visits and physician office visits had decreased. And then we also saw that there was a 74% drop in inappropriate specialist utilization. So this is just an illustration of how we actually follow ask -a -doc metrics. So not only are we looking at what are the RVUs assigned to the work being done, but we also create an opportunity for accountability of the work being done, meaning that the quality of what we're answering is also being evaluated. So looking at is the actual process being done correctly? Was it being done in the appropriate time frame? Was there the appropriate smart data elements that were being included in it? And then measure the turnaround time that um, really was measured. In addition to that, the person who's requesting the ask -a -doc consultation is also able to give feedback as to, was this helpful? Did this answer the question that I was asking? And so there was a, um, a, a rating system that was implemented for this. So when you move on, so we talked about the peer-to-peer -peer consultation. I think we're all very familiar with telemedicine and the utilization of a synchronous um, audio-visual type of uh, care. This is a paper that was from the 2018, where clearly this is before COVID, and it does give an illustration that sleep medicine was already primed for doing telemedicine. However, most of the times, um, there really were pilot projects being done. During COVID, we saw that there was a 100% conversion during the first wave of COVID. We saw then in 2021 that that reduced to about 75%. I would say that that still was a very significant amount of telemedicine being performed, as we saw most of the country retreat very quickly to about 15 to 25% of their encounters being telemedicine. We currently are still um, having about 50% of completed visits being performed via telemedicine. One of the things that I want to highlight is that when we're talking about telemedicine, we most typically are talking about this one-to-one -one, um, individual kind of consultation. Dr. Busis had raised the consideration of being able to get all the key stakeholders, and that's one way of kind of engaging more people. However, in our sleep psychology services, this has even been more broadened by being able to allow for cognitive behavioral therapy, specifically for insomnia, to be performed in a group setting versus individual setting. And so it allows for multiple patients coming from different walks of life and different availability to be able to engage from the comforts of their home and be able to get this more on the schedule that is going to be appropriate for them. So this really has increased not only the access, because I think everywhere in this country is ex experiencing a mental health crisis of being able to have the providers to fill the need, but also being a value in terms of convenience. 
So some additional lessons learned in central Pennsylvania is that um, the weather definitely can impact whether or not telemedicine is going to be more widely utilized or not. So when we make a comparison of telemed uh, usage during inclement weather in January, and then we're going to compare it to a little bit later on in the year. One of the things that we recognized was that there was an increase in the utilization of telemed services across all service lines. So there was about 17% of use in January. For those of you who are unfamiliar with central Pennsylvania, we very frequently will get those northeast, northeasterns um, where there is tons of snow and many times creating whiteout conditions that it's unsafe to travel for our patients and even for our providers. When you look at forward and go past January, you see that there was an even increased utilization and uptake of using telemedicine. Why was that? Because now many times the directors of these departments had learned that instead of waiting for the snow day to happen, they, when it was being predicted, they actually flipped these patients into telemedicine sooner. And many times that was met by the patients with much appreciation because of the safety parameters that they then were able to experience. As we move forward and look at a more broad way of considering how remote patient monitoring has been considered in, tel in um, sleep medicine in the past, most typically we would be reflecting on things like home sleep studies, or in this case, um, I think something that would be most akin to remote patient monitoring in the way that we think about it now would be actigraphy devices, which in here, this is giving an illustration of what we would use, which is a wrist-worn device. And what you're seeing on the computer is exactly what we typically would see from an interpretation of this. It uses accelerometry to really get a sense as to whether or not the person is lying or sitting and if there's any types of movements and gives an, a, a pretty close approximation of the amount of time being spent asleep, giving us an idea of duration of sleep and timing of sleep. Now, this was all fine and dandy, but the reality is, is that what we now have been exposed to is the fact that we may be able to utilize the same mindset of thinking about timing, duration, quality of sleep, but integrate it with a broader spectrum of remote patient monitoring. We currently at Geisinger are, are establishing a partnership with a um, company that will be able to help us in doing this exact thing. Being able to take the broader spectrum of remote patient monitoring and looking at all the other vital signs in combination with sleep monitoring to be able to actually utilize sleep for that homeostatic process for which it is. Being able to not look at sleep as a medical comorbidity, but part and parcel of the neurologic or other medical morbidities that may exist and utilize it as a part of the treatment package. And so now this is really creating a new and novel opportunity Opportunity. One of the things that very frequently we see, and in fact, the American Medical Association Telehealth Survey had demonstrated that 76% of physician respondents had frustration and difficulty with where does this actually create a central repository? How do we not have duplication of efforts? One of the things I'm proud to say of, as being a part of Geisinger is that we're currently working on a playbook for this and really trying to create those guiding principles and a rational, rationalization process in order to reduce all those challenges avoid the operational confusion and increase ease of use, really operating on the principles of interoperability, accountability, a secure system that is simple, able to be personalized, accessible, and is also engaging, creating that, that patient need to want to continue utilizing it. The final piece that I would like to cover is really, I think, one of the more disruptive kind of thoughts in regards to how can digital transformation and telehealth really be implemented in a way that maybe we haven't really considered previously. And that's meeting the patients where they are. For me, as a primary pediatric person, that may mean meeting them in a school district. However, broader areas that we're currently exploring as well is talking about meeting them at their work environment or meeting them somewhere else where they're spending the majority of their time. When you think about children and adolescents, many times the place that they're spending the majority of their time is in school. This is where we've conceptualized the program called Wake Up and Learn. Believe it or not, this was a program that was conceptualized before COVID was a thing. We created the game plan on this in 2019 and received philanthropic grant funding um, in 2020 between Geisinger Janet Weiss Children's Hospital and Jazz Pharmaceuticals to develop this program. 
This is a virtually delivered school-based sleep education and surveillance program. And part of the reason we developed this was really to educate this on the symptoms of sleep disturbances and try to help in redirecting the care pathways for these patients. We recognize when looking at the amount of times that children and adolescents are actually being recognized for their sleep problems, it's a small percentage based on how many children are actually impacted. We wanted to define the consequences of inadequate and problematic sleep, but also utilize it again as a tool to mitigate risk for other things. One of the things in the United States that we have seen as an alarming statistic is a very substantial increase in the amount of suicides, attempts, and completions in our children and adolescents. And we've seen over the course of the past 10 years a 50 to 80% increase in the amounts of suicide attempts and completions. We recognize that insufficient sleep in this age group increases risk-taking behaviors and also is considered a risk factor for suicidality in individuals who are depressed. So again, thinking about this as a part of the overall medical care the patient versus medical comorbidity. This also created that opportunity, as Dr. Busa said earlier, of involving the key stakeholders and meeting people where they are. When looking at this, we created um, a website to create that access to information and education, but we also provided universal screening. When reviewing the data that um, I will have in the next couple of slides, you'll also find that this meets the criteria that the World Health Organization lays out as what is appropriate for school-based health screenings and interventions. And that is disorder needs to be prevalent, needs to be screenable, and needs to be actionable. So we used validated scales to put, patient, put individuals in kind of the buckets of, is there concerning features or not? If there were concerning features, there then was the opportunity to opt into a more comprehensive digital delivery of information gathering for us to be able to provide that guidance as to what can be done in order to direct your care. Because of anti-Stark laws, we are not referring patients back directly to Geisinger. And again, this wasn't to drive consumerism to our hospital, but really to shift the delivery of care to where our students were all, most of the time. When we did this, um, as I mentioned earlier, we were then reflexing it to a more comprehensive screener. And then we also were able to give um, as needed screening throughout the year. When we did this, we had a very successful initial pilot where it was 87% completion of these screening surveys. And uh, one of the things that was very remarkable is how staggering the prevalence of sleep pathology is. It's about 62% had pathologic um, screening on one of the surveys, 17% on sleepiness surveys, and overall there was about a 64% presence of high-risk sleep pathology. Just to give a comparison, when you're looking at the medical literature for sleep pathology, we typically will quote 25 to 30% of children and adolescents will have a sleep problem. However, the most recent CDC statistics are demonstrating that 58 to 73 percent of middle school and high school students are experiencing at least insufficient sleep. And this data is more reflective of those, of those patterns. When we're looking at this, one of the additional pieces that I think is really important to call out is that when you're talking about sleep and especially school performance and, and health, many times we're usually reflexively having that conversation about delayed school start times. I'll inform you that this school that we are giving the pilot data on right now is a school that already has established delayed school start times. And one of the patterns that we're seeing is that we're identifying that there is a clear difference in terms of grade stratification. And so we see that those seventh and ninth graders tend to have a little bit better preservation of their sleep hours compared to our 10th and 12th graders. The reason this is important is because remember I stated that insufficient sleep increases risk-taking behavior and being able to conceptualize this data that you have your 10th to 12th graders who are most likely going to be more autonomous and potentially be driving may be at higher risk for significant injury related to this. Um, and to, as much as everyone would like to say that they're catching up on sleep on the weekends, what this data is demonstrating is that no one's catching up on sleep. They're still just as sleep deprived. The final piece that I'll just say, again, because of using a delivery system that is meeting students at the school and allowing the opportunity to look at how they evolve over the school year, we were also able to identify two patterns. One, that the majority of students who had pathologic sleep in the beginning of the year tended to maintain abnormal sleep throughout the year based on these surveys, but there was a small percentage, about 5 to 10 percent of students, who developed sleep pathology across the year. Again, creating opportunities to intervene at the time that the student needs it versus predefined arbitrary measures that we typically will say of, I'll see you in three months, I'll see you in six months, I'll see you in a year. 
So just to kind of give um, some informa more information about the program, one of the things I'll say is that um, we have successfully scaled this in additional middle school and high schools. Um, we also have created an adult program that is similar to this that is being delivered to medical schools, as well as our residency and fellowship programs. We also have a pilot in one of the universities. And we now are also um, implementing this through our Geisinger Health Plan, specifically for our, our CHIP members to be able to, again, um, meet one of those uh, needs that potentially isn't being evaluated, as well as um, providing this through a clinical implementation through our subspecialty uh, services as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Morse. Um, next, we have Dr. Nassim Zekavadi. She is an associate professor of neurology at Virginia Commonwealth University and the director of epilepsy at the Children's Hospital of Richmond. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology, serving on the Leadership Development Committee and the Telehealth Subcommittee under the Medical Economics and Practice Division. She has a special interest in the implementation of telehealth solutions to improve access to neurological care, particularly in underserved communities. Dr. Zekavadi advocates nationally and internationally for issues that affect children with neurological conditions, having served on adv advocacy committees at both the Child Neurology Society and the American Academy of Neurology. Thanks so much for sharing your expertise, Dr. Zekavadi, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Michaela, for that. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Morse, for that powerful presentation. And um, also just wanted to thank um, the American Academy of Neurology and the AMA for bringing this wonderful panel together um, and recognizing that um, telehealth um, affects uh, all ages and um, is really across, you know, as a service that we offer across the lifespan um, to both young patients and, and to elderly patients. And so today um, I'm going to be uh, speaking with you a little bit about telehealth and specifically how to utilize telehealth um, for patients with epilepsy. Uh, here are my disclosures. So our objectives in the next few minutes are to really discuss techniques to leverage telehealth in the care of patients with epilepsy and to talk about the office workflow to maximize the benefit of telehealth services. And lastly, to summarize information on reimbursement. It's really always the question at the end of the day, are these services, uh, are they reimbursable? So let's talk a little bit about ep about epilepsy. Uh, this is a condition that is responsible for 1% of the global burden of disease. More than 50 million people have epilepsy worldwide. And there are many barriers to care that include shortage of human resources, medical facilities and resources. And certainly those have all been exacerbated by the public health emergency. 80% of people with epilepsy live in low and middle income countries. And if you look sort of to this image um, on the left, that 60% of these individuals in other countries do not receive treatment for their epilepsy. So telehealth has tremendous potential of addressing these limited resources and improving access to individuals with epilepsy, not only within the United States, but really thinking larger about uh, our, our global community. So in a 2021 telehealth survey that Dr. Busis um, referenced earlier in the talk, what, you'll, what we found was post-pandemic, um, most physicians and certainly neurologists are no exception to this, were using primarily audiovisual interactive telehealth visits. But if you look at this bar graph, you'll also find that a substantial number of neurologists were using telephone and audio only calls for, with patients as well. And these are really relevant for uh, potentially patients that are um, older, that have difficulty with AV and you know, who have um, poor broadband access. You'll also see that there's asynchronous telehealth and remote patient monitoring um, being utilized to a lesser extent, but certainly those are the futures. And Dr. Kumar is going to talk with the, about those modalities today as well. So epilepsy is a chronic condition and it truly lends itself to care in a virtual environment. In the same um, survey that I referenced earlier, we found that most respondents are using telehealth for established patients. Um, and these are patients in whom the physical exam is unlikely to change 
uh, management. Now, I, and the, you know, there are exceptions to that rule. Certainly, um, the pediatric exam uh, patients, younger patients, or encephalopathic agent patients um, will benefit from you know, alternating with in-person visits to really be able to gauge those types of changes. Um, but also really just medication management and safety monitoring that can be very effectively performed in a, in a telemedicine encounter. Uh, and of course, reducing the burden, um, the cost of seeking care, particularly with inflation and gas prices being what they are, it is very challenging um, for our families to, to have that transportation um, to clinics that oftentimes are, are sometimes hours away from their home. And then of course, expediting those hospital follow-ups and those ER follow-ups. So a day in the life of, um, what does an audio video, visual, audio video visit workflow look like? Well, in general, um, an MA or a provider launches the appointment and ensures that the patient can connect. Um, in our recent um, rollout of Epic, um, I would say that a critical piece of our success was um, the work that went into ensuring that um, families were able to um, sign up to the portal and had access to the portal. And our nursing staff really did a fantastic job in ensuring our success um, in, in being able to connect with families. Um, you know, to perform that virtual video visit, uh, which is then followed by an after visit summary, which is generated electronically. The documentation is completed, the charge is dropped, and the encounter is signed, and it all sounds so easy. Now, for me personally, taking care of uh, younger patients and, and patients with an refractory epilepsy, um, one of the things that I, I always have to remind families is the patient has to be present. So for, for pediatric patients, we have to have them present in order to be able to perform the visit. Um, for patients that are very complex uh, in which there's many issues to address, I find it helpful to have a list of questions and prioritize them in case our signal drops for, some, for whatever reason. And in my experience, I've also found it very helpful to have a second AV modality. And so although we launch from um, my chart, I also sometimes will revert to Zoom if I have to. Um, and then if both of those fail, I convert to an audio only visit, which I think many of us are used to doing now. It's very helpful for this particular patient population to have a seizure log that's available for review. There are many free apps that can do this and generate beautiful reports. Ideally, these are all imported into the electronic medical record before the visit. So what does this look like? Well, I have a few vignettes that I thought we would just run through. And the first is an, a relatively uncomplicated patient, an eight-year-old male with childhood epilepsy with center temporal spikes, the condition we commonly see in, in, in children who remain seizure-free on levetiracetam for one year. On the day of the visit, the patient is checked in electronically. Our front desk staff will confirm consent for ambulatory care, confirm the consent for the telehealth encounter, and then the patient is roomed. Um, in our institution, um, we receive sort of, uh, the way I communicate with our staff is through a secure chat via Microsoft Teams. Um, no, no pager for this neurologist. Um, Teams really works well for, for us. Um, and then, you know, the, the visit is started. Um, we do an interval history. I find it helpful to do the exam early in the visit, particularly for younger patients with a limited attention span so that they can kind of then um, go and eat the rest of their breakfast or lunch or you know, do something else. Um, I then confirm the medications. I, I find it helpful to um, review COVID exposure and who in the family currently has COVID or is recovering from COVID. A recent wait is really important for this patient population, um, the seizure log, which we talked about, and then really reviewing those signs and symptoms and side effects um, and medication compliance. All of this can be done really easily um, in a, a telemedicine encounter. Um, I then, for this particular patient, will electronically send a three-month supply of levetiracetam. I'll adjust the dose for weight. I'll review any prior safety labs, order new safety labs if needed, ensure that a seizure rescue drug is available at home, and this particular patient who's old enough, intranasal diazepam would be the drug of choice, uh, update the seizure action plan, which we can send electronically to the patient via the portal. I'll then complete the ambulatory visit summary and mark the patient for follow-up in six months. So 
Documentation, um, many of us sort of have this down. I've included my telemedicine dot phrase here. It's, it's quite long, but I think having a robust dot phrase just makes it really easier. You put in your dot phrase at the end of, um, you know, the end or beginning of your note, depending on how you structure your note and ensure that all the key elements of, uh, of a telemedicine encounter are, are present. So we talked about an uncomplicated patient. Let's talk about a little bit more complicated patient and how this patient can be cared for in a virtual environment. This is a seven month old male born at 32 weeks gestation with bilateral grade three intraventricular hemorrhage, severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and tractive myoclonic epilepsy. This patient has uh, demonstrated a failure to respond to clobazam, levetiracetam and phenobarbital. This is a patient that I would like to consider for the ketogenic diet as our next sort of treatment modality. And so prior to the visit, realizing that that's the direction I'm headed, I'm going to order all of those ketogenic labs. I'm gonna make sure that they're drawn and reported before the visit. On the day of the visit, I'll have a pre-meeting with our fam fabulous nutritionist, and that will then be followed by a virtual visit, a telemedicine encounter with the patient, the parents, um, myself, the neurologist, and then the nutritionist. Um, an extensive, it's, it's, it's a very detailed visit, and it, it really is um, family education on how to prepare the formula, the equipment that's needed, including the use of a gram scale, um, body care, all glucose, including um, body care lotions and toothpaste have to be um, carbohydrate free, a sick day management, what to do in the event that your child gets sick, um, calculated programs and seizure and therapy logs. So there's a lot that goes into um, initiating the ketogenic diet or a dietary therapy in a patient with medically refractory epilepsy. And so historically, what we've seen is that this is a care team, right? I mean, there's a lot of individuals that are involved in this process and the keto team typically consists of not only dietitians and, and physicians, but also parents, nurses, social workers, um, and schools as well. And in a virtual environment, what that looks like is um, very similar. Um, physician, our nurse practitioners, our physician assistants, our dietitians, social workers, and psychologists. And remember that there is no change in eligible telehealth providers under the Medicare waiver. All of the individuals that were providing care to these patients before can continue to provide care in a telemedicine encounter. So, you know, without going into too much detail, um, you know, we want to make sure that our documentation is appropriate. So each of us is providing that documentation the same as a regular note, um, specifying any limitations in the exam. For me, as a neurologist, I'm going to identify medical decision making. I typically utilize time-based billing when possible. Um, so I'll report the visit duration, not for the time that everybody spent with the patient, but the time that I personally spent with the patient in that telehealth encounter. And then I'll um, drop the appropriate chart. Now, one of the really cool things that Dr. Pieces uh, alluded to earlier is principal care management codes. So these are um, almost certainly being underutilized right now. And it's, it really represents a shift away from fee for service and uh, recognizing um, value-based care and appropriately uh, valuing this type of team-based approach to care. These are the services that are non-face-to-face -face and are designed for patients such as those with refractory epilepsy who have one chronic condition manifested by a single complex chronic condition expected to last at least three months with a significant risk for morbidity and mortality. Patients have to be aware that there are that this service is being rendered. They have to provide consent. And the care that then takes place in a calendar month of establishing that ketogenic care plan, implementing it, revising the plan, and then reviewing the logs. So as the patient is sending you their logs with um, their blood glucose levels and their urine ketone levels, um, those are all um, you know, perfectly suited to a principal care management um, uh, billing. And so I want to sort of talk about a different type of patient 
um, in vignette number three. So in our first vignette, we talked about the uncomplicated patient. The second one, we talked about uh, a refractory patient with, um, you know, requiring a multidisciplinary approach. And in this vignette, we have a 43-year-old right-handed male with vocal epilepsy since age eight, who now calls with increased frequency of breakthrough seizures. He continues to experience brief focal unaware seizures lasting up to several minutes. He has completed an extensive pre-surgical evaluation and would like to discuss the results. He also needs a refill of his oxcarimazepine and levetiracetam. So this is a phone visit. So a phone visit in which we're going to review um, this patient's uh, concerns. The documentation for a phone visit should indicate that the patient initiated the contact. So, you know, as, as Dr. Morris sort of mentioned earlier, it's, you know, we want to all be valued for that time. Returning that phone call, it's gonna be a detailed conversation, right? This is a, a patient that's undergoing a surgical evaluation. And so documenting um, the, the chief complaint, and the response and the method of contact. Um, detail what occurred during the communication, um, that you refilled medications. Um, all of this is to establish medical necessity. You wanna ensure that the documentation um, indicates that this was not tied to a face-to-face -face encounter or to a telemedicine encounter within the past seven days. You wanna ensure that the patient consents to having that service provided over the phone. Um, as always, document the time that you spent uh, with the patient um, and look, include the location of the patient as well for billing purposes. And this brings me to my fourth and final vignette, um, which is a 10-year-old uh, patient with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome with daily tonic seizures. He recently had implantation of a vagal nerve stimulator. The patient is on clobazam, valproic acid, and levetiracetam. This patient was seen in the office two weeks following surgery, at which time the VNS was auto-programmed. Telehealth visits can then be scheduled on the day of each setting change, at which time the changes can be reviewed for side effects, labs ordered, medications refilled. And so really thinking beyond, you know, our sort of traditional in-person encounters and the future of what epilepsy care in a, in a virtual environment can look like um, for patients, including um, patients um, in whom uh, neurostimulators are being used. You know, neurostimulation and telehealth, I think, is sort of the next frontier. And this includes not only vagal nerve stimulation, but RNS and, um, and DBS as well. So how do we develop that workflow? How do we incorporate neur neurostimulation when all of this information is typically being uploaded to a cloud? How do we review that information and communicate effectively uh, with our patients? And Dr. Kumar is going to have, I think, some wonderful things to, um, to talk with us uh, in that regard. And with that, I'm going to uh, sort of pass uh, pass the baton on to him. Thank you so much, Dr. Zakabadi. Um, as Dr. Zakabadi mentioned, our final case study presentation is from Dr. Ben Coomer. Dr. Ben Coomer is an assistant professor and director of clinical informatics in the Department of Neurology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. A board certified stroke neurologist and clinical informaticist, Dr. Coomer serves as a subject matter expert in applications of healthcare IT to neurological care processes at Mount Sinai, which encompasses telehealth, aggregative data visualizations, and development of machine learning models to support neurological decision making. Dr. Coomer was instrumental to his institution's shift to video teleneurology during the COVID-19 pandemic and currently serves as the vice chair of the telehealth subcommittee at the American Academy of Neurology. Additionally, Dr. Coomer leads the implementation of various asynchronous asynchronous technology, excuse me, teleneurology initiatives such as remote data collection and interprofessional consultations at his home institution. Thanks so much, Dr. Coomer, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Michaela, and thanks to the AMA and the AAN for putting this terrific program together. I'm really honored to be here I'm speaking alongside my distinguished colleagues. It's uh, really very large shoes to fill to, uh, to follow all of that excellent material. Um, uh, today, I'll be talking mainly about Telestroke and the global 30,000 or maybe 10,000 foot view of the future of teleneurology. Um, and I want to leave some time for questions. So let's jump right into it. Next slide, please. These are my disclosures. So talking about Telestroke first. Um, next slide, please. 
We're going to go over some brief uh, definitions first. Um, a telestroke is really the application of synchronous audio video telemedicine to stroke neurology. Um, and it's almost the sort of classic archetypal teleneurology use case. Um, it was first described in a very, very influential paper in stroke in 1999. Um, Steve Levine and Mark Gorman sort of wrote an uh, a opinion piece around it. Um, and shortly thereafter, in the same year, also in stroke, a paper um, was published that compared NIH stroke scale assessments, which is the physical exam assessment in stroke to video NIH stroke scale assessments, and basically found that both of those were essentially accurate and, and, and related, if, if you will. So um, since then, we've, we've seen a steady increase in telestroke programs worldwide and, and in the United States, uh, given that physical examination and, over video and in person were essentially uh, the same. And as of 2019, uh, at least a quarter of US hospitals have access to telestroke programs. And this comes from a recent uh, paper from 2020. Uh, and that's probably an understatement, uh, given the fact that a lot of that was survey data from uh, teleneurology company networks and teleneurology um, and academic centers. Next slide, please. So the basic components of a telestroke system are very similar to the components of other systems. But as Dr. Busis mentioned, the setting in which uh, stroke care typically occurs is not, it's not typically at home. So there's always going to be a remote physician who's initiating the call for telestroke to, um, or sorry, the remote physician is going to be handling the, the, the call for, te for telestroke from an onsite physician uh, or other provider who's typically located in an ED or a mobile stroke unit um, and more rarely on a hospital floor. Um, there also needs to be some kind of synchronous AV communication technology and an infrastructure and system to uh, work that technology. And finally, a staffing model needs to be present as well. Next slide, please. I, I wanna just spend a little bit of time talking about why telestroke is sort of a classic excellent use case in, in neurology. And it really comes down to access to specialized stroke care, which is a huge problem in our country and worldwide, really. First, uh, uh, is acute ischemic stroke, which is the most common cause uh, of stroke, arguably, in this country affects about 700,000 patients every year. And uh, as we all know, strokes can be completely devastating. And this disease imposes a huge social cost and burden um, to the public health system. Um, the, the standard treatment for acute ischemic stroke, which is known colloquially as TPA, its generic name is Altaplace, which is an IV medication given as a bolus and then a drip over a, a specific period of time, um, is really underutilized in the community, um, either because of misconceptions around the evidence supporting TPA use, um, but also because there's a very, very big shortage of stroke neurologists and stroke capable centers, especially in rural areas of the United States. And you add to that the fact that TPA has a very, very narrow therapeutic window. You really have, you, you really should be giving TPA, if you're practicing by the guidelines, at least between zero and four and a half hours from stroke onset or last known well. And the benefit of TPA tends to go down um, the further you get from the onset of the stroke and the greater the risk of hemorrhagic complications. And finally, one of the reasons that makes this such a good use case is that you can really um, make the decision as to whether you want to give a patient TPA or whether they're eligible or not really easily over audio video telehealth. Next slide, please. So um, telestroke care models are basically divided into two general buckets, um, the hub and spoke model and the so-called hub list model. Um, the hub and spoke model refers to the analogy of a, a wheel, if you will, where there's a center, a central hospital at the hub of the, at the wheel that then is connected via telehealth relationships or audio video connections to spoke hospitals that are on the periphery. Um, you, you can see that in panel A right there on the top left. Um, and within the hub and spoke model, there are really two different paradigms of treatment. One is called drip and ship, and the other one is called drip and keep. I did not make these um, descriptions up. These are actually legitimate um, descriptions in the published literature, as you can see in the upper right-hand side there. Drip and ship just refers to treatment 
of a patient with TPA at a spoke hospital and then transfer to a hub hospital, as you can see in panel A. And drip and keep is just the patient gets TPA at the spoke hospital and is kept at the spoke hospital for further evaluation, workup, placement, et cetera. Whereas in drip and ship, that occurs um, at the hub hospital. Then to contrast that, you have the hubless model, which is uh, it can sort of take two forms. One is either around a private practice group um, and another is around a telemedicine company, which is kind of functionally the same as a private practice organization. But if you think about it uh, at a higher level, basically a hubless system is where the decision-making um, is central, but the transfers of patients is a distributed process. So you can sort of see that in panel D to the right, where there's a private practice group that is covering a bunch of spoke hospitals for decision-making as to whether patients get treatment or whether they need to be transferred. And then those transfers occur to other hub hospitals that are not necessarily related to the central private practice or in panel C, the uh, central telemedicine company. Next slide, please. So Dr. Busis did mention some of the evidence briefly in his presentation, but there's a lot of very good quality data supporting um, the use of Telestroke and it, it, throughout the last two decades since its appearance and its publication in Stroke in 1999. Um, so as I mentioned before, neurological exams done over Telestroke are really accurate and basically the same in terms of their accuracy compared to in-person examinations. Um, and Telestroke, in a nutshell, increases access to specialized stroke care, and that includes treatment, um, workup, stroke units, et cetera. So unsurprisingly, in the literature, Telestroke has been found to be associated with increases in thrombolytic rates um, in the spoke hospitals or other types of arrangements. Um, and because TPA improves mortality in patients with acute ischemic stroke and um, also results in improved functional outcomes at 90 days and further out uh, in patients with ischemic stroke, it's because your access is increased through telestroke, it's unsurprising that telestroke is really associated with improved mortality profiles and better, if, and better effectiveness compared to in-person care um, in, in, in hospitals that do not have in-person stroke coverage. So, you know, it's really essentially echoing what Dr. Busis had mentioned, you know, telestroke is the practice of stroke. Um, so it, we're really increasing access. And so the, the literature really reflects that. I think it's important to mention that most research on telestroke does come from single center academic institutions, many of which are at the center of a hub and spoke model. So while those things are, there's very robust evidence and I didn't list all of it in the slide because it would probably be a whole topic of an hour long talk if I did. Um, it, all this information should be taken with a tiny little bit of, of grain of salt. But next uh, slide, please. So I'm going to shift gears here and talk about asynchronous teleneurology in the future, where we're going with, with teleneurology. And what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is I'm going to sort of talk about what's happening now in asynchronous teleneurology and tele, you know, various asynchronous services and try to come up with a prediction in the following slide around what I think is you know, going to be happening in terms of general themes. Next slide, please. So I think we're all witnessing a global shift of the healthcare system to uh, going from synchronous care delivery systems to asynchronous care delivery systems. And we're seeing a shift that has been seen in banking and retail already. And healthcare is just a little bit behind that. Um, and we're also seeing a convergence of telehealth and telehealth systems onto mobile device platforms. Um, Essentially, as you can see in this uh, graph here, we're moving from a conventional sort of centralized, synchronous, hospital-based, sort of live one-on-one -on -one, um, and audio-visual vi vi uh, uh, interaction to a system that's more distributed, more convenient, less centralized, um, and asynchronous that doesn't involve live interactions one-on-one -on -one in, in that in the way that it sort of has been previously. This graph is actually from a excellent review of teleneurology from about five years ago in Nature Reviews Neurology by uh, Ray Dorsey. I highly recommend it if anybody's interested um, in reviewing sort of thought pieces on teleneurology, it's really excellent. This graph actually chronicles the RCTs that have been done in telehealth 
according to the setting in which they've been conducted. And in orange below, you can see the year of the first RCT inception where they, where they actually started. And you can see just chronologically, there's a shift from hospitals to clinics to home to the mobile phone. And that's very similar to what we've seen in finance or in retail, where you have something happening, a transaction happening at the teller or at a store, then you know, moving to an ATM or a mall, then web-based transactions, and finally converging onto smartphone transactions. So healthcare is really kind of going in the same direction, um, where we're not going to be dealing with physicians as much face-to-face -face in a synchronous fashion. Next slide, please. So as Dr. Morse um, mentioned, there, there's a lot of activity around remote patient monitoring and collection of data uh, by sensors and actigraphs and other types of devices and wearables and sending those data streams to responsible providers that then make decisions or assessments on that data. Um, and I think it's important to mention that a lot of those uh, systems are not well integrated into EHRs. Um, and that's something that's definitely a gap that needs to be further explored. And I'm contrasting remote data sharing and patient monitoring here in the sense that patient monitoring, really there's an expectation of frequent data monitoring and decision-making that may be more relevant in a blood pressure management program where there's much more fluctuation um, and remote data sharing where, where the data is being transmitted, but there's no expectation that the data is being monitored in real time or quasi real time. Um, and so sort of to address this gap of integration, we've actually piloted something at Sinai where we are using the Apple Health Kit and Google Fit architecture. And I'll talk about that in a second to collect step counts in patients with multiple sclerosis. And step counts have been shown in the literature to be associated with uh, disability and multiple sclerosis. Um, and the beauty of the system is that it actually um, leverages the patient's own device uh, and it essentially connects Epic um, through a flow sheet and my chart to um, a patient's um, individual device and to their, their, their Apple Health or Google Fit app, which then can connect to other wearables um, that you may have or that um, already exist in the sensors of the phone itself. So uh, it starts with the physician order that gets sent to my chart. The patient then syncs their device to my chart. And then once that happens, there's passive data uh, flowing into the EHR. So we're getting for about 20 patients over the last year, we're collecting daily step counts in MS patients that they don't even think about. It just uses the, the a standard step counts that they already have. And, patient, and patients get that information reviewed by the MS physician at the time of their visit. So it's not real-time monitoring but it's more remote data sharing. Next slide, please. This is just um, our cumulative enrollments. Um, so we're up to 20 patients at this point since April of 2021. Next slide, please. But I think towards the future, we're gonna be talking about and seeing many new types of data being um, integrated and uh, incorporated into our decision-making, into our armamentarium of, of patient assessments. And I think one of the main categories that we're going to be seeing this in is in imaging. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more transmission and analysis of video data, namely of the physical examination in neurology um, and other phenomenology such as paroxysmal events like dystonia or seizures. Um, we're also going to be seeing a sort of higher level integration of complex um, time-locked physiologic data streams of wearables. Um, right now, there's a lot of integration or just single streams of data from single wearables or single sensors, but I think we're going to be seeing a lot of computationally complex integration of all of those different wearable signals to, to phenotype different um, motor disorders, for example, or standardized assessments in disease. And that's actually, that's already starting to happen in Parkinson's disease. We're also going to be seeing um, the digitization of social, social network activity and sociability and displacement and, and, um, and what somebody's digital life space actually is and what it means for their condition. This can be particularly relevant for patients that have cognitive disorders or visuospatial disorders. Um, and we're going to be seeing a lot of integration of more treatment data, namely around symptom diaries, um, responses to various therapies and adverse events. Next slide, please. There was some mention in a 
a number of my esteemed uh, colleagues' presentations on interprofessional consultations, which are an, a form of asynchronous teleneurology. Um, and we've actually launched an e-consult program in neurology in October of 2019, which is all EPIC integrated, um, similar to the ASCADOC uh, program at Geisinger, um, where the EPIC order basically is initiated by the requesting physician that contains a clinical question that's pictured in the lower left-hand corner here. Um, it has a lot of clinical history, very, very detailed clinical history for a variety of different uh, symptoms. This, once it, the order is signed, routes to an in-basket pool, which is pictured right here on the lower, the lower right-hand side, um, that's staffed by five different neurologists for the, each of the day of the week. Um, and the consultant will then field the question, complete any consult note in EPIC, and then drop a bill. Uh, the, the exact code is 99451 um, for interprofessional consultation. And the note will actually route back to the individual requester. We've been pretty successful in this program. We've done about 430 consultations since we started. Most of these referrals or, or consults really come from Medicaid internal medicine clinics in the Sinai system. Um, next slide, please. This is actually a graph I wanted to show. So out of all of the interprofessional consultations that we've done in neurology, um, the majority have actually resulted in an electronic recommendation. And the majority of those electronic recommendations basically avoided a referral to, for an in-person visit in our neurology clinics, which are chronically overbooked and the wait times for which are extremely long. So I think this is a big win in the sense that we're reducing, that we're improving access to neurological services without um, worsening the patient experience, if you will, and a number of other important outcomes. Uh, next slide, please. I think we're going to be seeing a, a, many different modes of, of interacting between patients and providers and communicating between both parties in the, as, as we move towards the future. I think the technology of chatbots is going to become much more sophisticated than what it is now, namely because the artificial intelligence algorithms and natural language processing algorithms that are developing and will be developed are going to be much more sophisticated in handling and parsing text and illness scripts and triaging such that patients will really have 24 seven availability to you know, asynchronous uh, care. Uh, if they have a question about their medication or they have a, a symptom that they don't know really know what to do with. And I think there's also going to be the leverage of sort of more accessible traditional um, technologies like text and SMS um, to do digital outreach and surveillance in vulnerable populations that may be on the other side of the digital divide, which I'll speak about in a few slides. Um, sort of in parallel, I think digital patient journeys are starting, already starting to be developed and will continue to become much more important around symptoms. Um, I think patients are gonna stop going through their physician networks to kind of get referrals. And I think they're gonna start with technology to find a referral in an intelligent way and to be connected to resources. So a few examples of that are apps that are so-called digital front doors, um, uh, health systems, are gonna be developing their own apps, which are basically health system, all things health system on an application on your mobile phone. And patients will start to search for their symptoms um, in these apps and then be connected to resources, providers, different tools to manage their disease as opposed to going through the traditional channels. Again, this is entirely asynchronous. It does not have to take place during an audiovisual or a face-to-face -face encounter with a physician. So it, again, just kind of going back to that slide, uh, with the Ray Dorsey figure, we're really going towards a more sort of distributed model. Um, and we're also going to be seeing, similarly in the private sector, doctor on demand services for specific disease verticals like Roe and Hems. Roe and Hems have established themselves really in the male urology and sort of pattern baldness vertical, but they're very shortly going to be branching out into additional verticals um, so that patients can be connected to providers immediately based on symptoms and, and requests. Next slide, please. I want to briefly talk about PCM since a number of my colleagues mentioned this. Um, just to reiterate, PCM is a service that essentially leverages the entire health team, which can comprise providers, APPs, PTs, SLPs, what have you, um, for the care coordination and management of one chronic condition uh, for at least three months um, per team. And this is a time-based service. So you have to accrue a certain number of minutes every month before you can, before you can build the service. But um, we've actually 
uh, built a PCM module in Epic and are piloting this at, in, at Sinai with a number of different neurological conditions. And we've received an $80,000 Office of Wellbeing and Resilience grant to build this module. And this is from scratch because Epic does not actually have anything like this out of the box. This allows the assignment of care plans and goals, um, care targets, task tracking. Um, it's very complex, uh, very cool. I'm very proud of it personally. Um, and on the right-hand side here, you can see the enrollment form because as Dr. Zekovati and Dr. Buse has mentioned, the consent and sort of patient involvement and decision-making is key in, uh, in, in enrolling a patient into the, the program. And then in the bottom, you see a smart form where you can track your time for uh, the services that you may render. Um, so we've launched this in ALS uh, Q4 of last year, and we just started doing this in MS. Um, and if you can just scroll through the next animation, there's a accrual um, graph here where you can see we're up to about 23 patients in ALS um, and six, patient, uh, six team members that have been trained. So let's go to the next slide, please. And shifting towards the future to echo something that Dr. Zekovati said, um, principal care management obviously requires care planning that's part and parcel of the PCM service. There's goal setting around those um, and embedded in those care plans. But I think an important thing to mention is that PCM doesn't really specify how the provider or the care team interacts with the patient. It can be asynchronous, it can be synchronous, it can be on the phone, it can be a digital e &M service, it can be a variety of different things. Um, and that includes data review of asynchronous wearable information like we're doing in step counts in MS um, that may not be billable by the, the um, traditional sort of by the book CPT uh, coding guidelines for remote patient monitoring because it's not an FDA approved device and so on, you can actually count those services uh, towards PCM time spent and towards PCM billing. So I think to echo Dr. Zekovati's point, what we're gonna be seeing in the future is that PCM and these care coordination services are really going to be blazing a path towards value-based uh, care and value-based payment models, which have been talked about for a very long time and are really the minority of a lot of services um, in the United States but uh, uh, will probably become more and more important as we go forward. Next slide, please. We're also gonna be seeing a lot more high quality evidence on the value proposition in teleneurology in the COVID pandemic context and sort of after the COVID uh, pandemic or in the, the COVID pandemic that we're li obviously living through. Um, and we'll also be seeing a lot of a lot more alignment of professional societies like the AN with the evaluation of teleneurological care and care quality um, with formal quality frameworks like that developed by the NQF, as well as the framework that you all have developed at the AMA, um, and an increasing shift towards digital patient reported outcome measures to measure effectiveness of teleneurological care. Next slide, please. I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention the buzzword that is tequity. Um, teleneurology, I think, is also uh, going to increasingly attempt to address the digital divide and, and the issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion that we experienced during the massive shift to digital medicine I and mean, digital neurology by that extension uh, during the COVID pandemic. Um, I don't think this is something that health systems and practitioners can really ignore anymore. This is uh, a very, very hot topic right now. And I think what we're going to be seeing in teleneurology specifically is efforts towards increasing accessibility to very well-established technologies like texting for vulnerable populations, as well as decreasing barriers to newer technologies that may require uh, a greater digital literacy or a greater access to broadband or other technologies, such as video, synchronous video platforms and other wearable devices. Um, next slide, please. And finally, I wanna sort of close with the future um, state of teleneurology with respect to artificial intelligence, which is going to be increasingly present in our world, um, not just in neurology, but really everywhere in medicine. I wanna break down different uh, conceptual categories of artificial intelligence. There are three of them, namely assistive AI, analytic AI, and autonomous AI. Um, assistive AI is really stuff that you've probably seen in your practice or even in your, in, your, in your daily routines. It's really the pattern recognition and automation of simple processes. One really, really good example of that 
which is still kind of in its experimental phase, is detection of seizures automatically from an EEG waveform. It's not making decisions, it's not acting independently of the human being, but it's recognizing a pattern and maybe it alerts you uh, of it, for example. Analytic AI is a little bit more complex in the sense that it sort of enhances or adds to human decisions. A good example of that could be a chatbot that detects an illness script of a headache, um, a specific type of headache, and suggests a multiple choice of diagnosis or hones in on the diagnosis of migraine or trigeminal neuralgia and then notifies the physician and suggests something, but does not make the decision that this is trigeminal neuralgia and have to start carbamazepine, for example. Um, and then finally, the sort of more aspirational, further off and almost slightly scary uh, AI, to be perfectly honest, is the autonomous um, AI, which is designed to act independently of humans and really make decisions on its own. I, I think a good example of this, which we're gonna be tending towards in the future, is a smart home or a smart exam room that has multiple cameras, uh, voice recognition technology that sort of leverages the same technology that, that we use for Amazon um, and, and, and uh, Alexa and Siri um, and motion sensors. I, I think that's gonna be increasingly prevalent in cognitive disorders and movement disorders. Um, for example, a smart home could identify that a patient's fallen um, and automatically activate EMS, automatically make some referrals, automatically notify the care team and sort of act independently uh, to a certain extent. So that's still a ways off, but it's something that's coming on the horizon and we're gonna have to talk about it in to, to increasing degrees. Next slide, please. I think it's very important to mention that AI in the future I don't visualize this, and this may be a topic for debate, but my opinion is that AI is not going to replace providers. I think um, it's really going to enable providers to practice at the top of their license. It's going to be able to automate a lot of the rote, sort of less complicated stuff that physicians have to do day to day and really allow them to focus on the real nuances of their specialties or you know, taking care of their patients clinically. Um, I think it's it, patients will still need human touch that's inevitable. And so in that sense, AI is not here to replace providers. Um, I think it's really here as a supportive technology. And I think we're gonna be seeing an increasing amount of consideration being devoted to equity and ethics in AI model design. I know that there's, a, at, at Sinai, for example, there is a committee on artificial intelligence equity that was recently formed to regulate the way that we kind of put together our models um, and integrate them into the health system to make sure that this is equitable for everyone. I will say though, that as we move towards more asynchronous distributed services with increasing amounts of touch points in between in-person visits, um, and I, I do, I would argue that the frequency of in-person interactions may decrease because our touch points outside of these synchronous visits will increase. But again, I do wanna make the point that patients will still need that human touch and they still will, um, the AI will not be replacing providers, in my opinion. So um, let's go to the next slide. I think I'm actually finished there. So I'll stop there. And um, I just want to thank everybody for their attention. This is an amazing opportunity. I'm so honored to be here. Um, and I wanted to thank the AMA and the AN, as well as my colleagues for some excellent presentations. Um, and hopefully it were informative for you all. So I will stop there and turn it over for discussion. Great, thanks Dr. Coomer. And I know we're running a little bit behind, um, so if you have a hard stop, feel free to drop off, but we will take a few uh, audience questions now. So um, Laura, if we can just turn off the slides quickly here. And um, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand, use the raise hands, hand function, it's under the reactions. Um, and we can start with this first one. This one's for, for Dr. Morse, um, and it's in reference to the Ask a Doc service. And this uh, Lanny is asking, who pays for the service? Does insurance pay or is it self pay? Sure. So um, uh, with the Ask a Doc service, there was a specific um, uh, plan not to do billing. So the RVUs that are assigned to it is to create a value for the provider that gets accommodated into when we're looking at the productivity of the provider. So there isn't necessarily a billing that there that we've chosen to do with it um, in order to just make sure that there's no barriers in terms of who would be able to have access to it um, and not putting that additional burden on the patient because we viewed it as being something that may reduce the likelihood of utilizing the 
service and just further increasing the healthcare utilization because people would dis- decide, I'll see the provide, I'll just go see the specialist. I don't want to pay for just the opinion without actually seeing them. Great, thank you. Any questions from the audience? We had one um, in the registration report. Oh, maybe there's. Oh. By, by creating an ask a doc, it does not create a doc patient relationship because it's a peer to peer consultation. Um, uh, the um, per- specialist who is providing feedback does not now have a patient relationship. So that patient is now not able to like my Geisinger or my chart me or something like that. So it doesn't create that kind of formalization and nor does it create that um, liability of, of now assuming the care of that patient. I have a question and I'm sorry, I don't have the chat feature on my phone. Yes, go Um, ahead. My question is uh, with regard to research for supporting the future use, what are the highest priorities for trying to document the benefits? You know, we were just at ANNOH and the biggest concern was cost and adding to cost of healthcare. Um, What are, what's going on with research and what are the biggest areas that should be focused on? I can uh, take that, Elaine. Uh, Elaine is uh, one of the pioneers in teleneurology, and I'm so thrilled that you could join us, Elaine. Um, So there have been, I think, two big questions from payers about teleneurology. Not so much stroke, because that's pretty well established, but everything else. One is that the quality would be bad, and two, that just like um, they thought email would reply, would, would replace fax machines, they figured, oh, but now people go both fax and email the same thing in some states. The, the, the uh, payers are afraid that every teleneurology visit will lead to an in-person visit, and so you'll actually double the costs. So I think that, that those are the two things we need to look at is utilization, is it substitutive or additive, uh, to in-person visits and and what are the outcomes? You know, does it work? So those I think are going to be the two uh, focuses. And and there are some um, clever ways to get at this. For example, if there's already quality information being um, uh, collected and analyzed in your health system, uh, if you look at a claims database or a big database like that, you can say, okay, look at the in-person ones, look at the, out, the, the, the telehealth ones and compare them if the outcomes are the same, plus prospective studies. So I hope that answers your uh, question. Feel free to reach out if there's any questions. Laura, I'll ask you to pull up the slides here quickly. We have just a couple of housekeeping items to wrap up today's event. Um, you must have received a feedback survey. It's a three question survey. We appreciate your feedback, feedback in advance. And then Michaela, do you wanna share resources from the AAN? Yeah, absolutely. Um, The AAN is working to revamp our telehealth webpage, which will look like the image here on the right. Um, Much of this information is there already, but later this summer, um, members of the telehealth subcommittee um, in combination with some subject matter experts have developed a guide to practicing teleneurology. Um, And given the uncertain legislative and regulatory future, um, this guide was really created to apply to clinicians regardless of their patient population or registered or geography. And to supplement that guide, we um, will also release two tips and tricks guides for telehealth for patients with a neuromuscular, as well as an ocular, motor, or vestibular disorder. Um, and later this fall, we um, will release um, best practices for um, training residents in teleneurology. So we look forward to that. So feel free to visit our website, an.com slash telehealth and um, explore there and feel free to reach out with any questions and our practice um, at an.com email address as well. Thank you. Great, next slide. And just to, Keep you updated on upcoming telehealth immersion program events. This is the next one will be June 21st, Accelerating Behavioral Health Integration Through Telehealth. And these links um, and registrations will be shared following this presentation. 
And if you have not already been on the Physician Innovation Network, this is an online social networking platform. If you'd like to connect after this discussion, if you have more questions that you weren't able to ask, I mean, we welcome you to go to the site. You can use the QR code here um, and we can let the presenters know if you have questions and they can tune in and answer. Again, thank you again. Here's our contact information. I'll give you a second to look at that. Um, and thank you all for joining. Thank you so much. And special thanks to Michaela, Dr. Busis, Dr. Morse, Dr. Zekavadi, and Dr. Coomer. Thank you so much, everyone. We will see you next time.